Question oral. Oral questions, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia and New Zealand all announced that Huawei would have no place in their 5G infrastructure years ago. Our Prime Minister has still not made a decision. The Five Eyes all came out with a diplomatic boycott of the Olympics and the Prime Minister was the last one to sign on. When it comes to the international stage, why is this Prime Minister always the last one to show up? Mr. Speaker, our approach has always been to stand up strongly for Canadians, for Canadian interests, for Canadian values, and do that every step of the way alongside our allies in the world. Uh, we have done that. We will continue to do that as we uh, express uh, deep concerns uh, about the situation around human rights in China, as we continue uh, to ensure protection for our security while uh, we look at competitiveness for our domestic markets. These are things that we take seriously that we will always do the right way for Canadians. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, more than a quarter of Canadians have mortgages with a variable rate. The number of high-leverage uninsured mortgages is more than 25 per cent, according to the Bank of Canada. The bank suggested today that it will raise interest rates soon, and some experts predict five interest rate increases next year. How many thousands of families are at risk of losing their homes because this Prime Minister has ignored the inflation crisis? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are extremely concerned with the rising costs of living faced by Canadians, which is why we have a concrete plan to take action on that, whether it's by investing uh, in childcare, whether it's more support for Canadians, or it's putting forward the most ambitious plan uh, on housing that this country has ever seen, which uh, includes $4 billion for municipalities to help build more supply, while at the same time the Conservatives only had to offer tax breaks for Canada's wealthiest landlords in the last election campaign. Campaign. Canadians need solutions. That's what we're delivering, not them. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, higher inflation means higher prices for families. 21% higher for apples, 22% higher for bacon, 33% higher for a house. The Prime Minister says he has a concrete plan, but this government has not committed to keeping the 2% inflation target as part of the bank's new mandate. Keeping the 2% inflation target, Mr. Speaker, is the bare minimum this Prime Minister could do to fight the cost of living crisis. So he talks about a plan, he talks about being there for Canadians. My, my question is simple. Will the government mandate the Bank of Canada to maintain its 2% target? Yes or no? The right honourable Prime Minister. Even though the Conservatives are offering the bare minimum, we are interested in offering much more to Canadians. Yes, we will renew the mandate of the Bank of Canada, but we will also continue to step up uh, with record investments in housing and things like the Rent to Own program, in a municipal accelerator that's going to put more housing uh, across the country, in more support for rural Canadians on housing. We have a concrete plan to invest in housing. The Conservatives only offered massive tax breaks to wealthy landlords as their solution to the housing crisis. That's not what Canadians need. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Canadians should be worried when the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister won't answer a simple question about fighting inflation, right. keeping the 2% target. What are they going to do for Canadians who are struggling? He doesn't think about monetary policy. He doesn't think about interest rates. He thinks budgets will balance themselves. How bad does the cost of living crisis have to get before this Prime Minister gets a grip? Yeah. The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, while the Conservative Party flails around and offers personal insults, we are focused on Canadians. We are focused on investing tangibly uh, to counter the housing crisis, whether it's $4 billion for municipalities, whether it's investments in $10 a day childcare right across the country, whether it's support for seniors, support for young families. We are there. We will continue to be there for Canadians while the Conservatives play political games and throw mud. That's right. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, inflation has never been as bad as it is now. 
It is the increased cost of everything, fruits, meat, gas. The list is long and Canadians are concerned. This government has not given the mandate to the Bank of Canada to keep the inflation target at 2 percent. Will the government maintain the 2 percent target, yes or no? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition knows full well that we will make an announcement very shortly on this. Uh, the reality is, is that we're focusing on the challenges that Canadians are facing. That is why we are investing massive amounts in housing and helping municipalities to create more housing. We are investing in more child care spots across the country. We are investing to help seniors, young people. We are here to help Canadians. The Conservatives on housing are only offering tax credits for the richest Canadians so they can sell their real estate. That's not what Canadians need. We will continue to be there for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Bel Air Chambly. Mr. Speaker, under the new regulations, whether you travel by land or plane in Europe, the U.S. So, or in a country in Africa, whether you come in or out of the U.S., the rules are different. Travelers will face health procedures that will mean they will have to do things that even asterisks wouldn't have to do. Why does Canada not put in place uh, reassuring rules and procedures that are clear, reciprocal, like the ones imposed in the U.S.? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the COVID crisis has required required changes based on science and the situation. Canadians know full well this, and they know that our government will be here with the measures that are required to support them, no matter what the situation. I understand that there are new rules in place, and I understand that it can be confusing for those who wish to travel and who may have to travel, but the vast majority of Canadians need us to do everything necessary to keep them healthy and safe. That's what we've been doing since the beginning of the pandemic, and it's not something we're going to stop now. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Let's clarify, Mr. Speaker. Imagine, let's give an example. The Prime Minister uh, travels to Egypt. Uh, on the way back, he goes through Paris to say hi to Macron. He goes to Burlington before he goes to Canada by land, not through Roxham Road, ideally. Quarantine, airport tests, subcontractors coming to the House. Can the Prime Minister tell us what rules he will be subjected to, what tests he'll have to take, what will be the constraints, and when? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Anybody who travels or who decides to travel must consult the public health authorities and look at the rules that are in place that concern their situation. I don't think it's too complicated to understand that each person who has to travel will have to take action accordingly, and we will share all the information. The reality is that, yes, it can be complicated, but it requires, and it, we must be there to protect uh, Canadians from Omicron, and we have to look at the consequences to protect the vast majority of Canadians who are staying home and who want to be done with COVID-19. Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Monsieur, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A recent analysis in Montreal shows an increase of 21 percent in a house price over a year. It's impossible for people to find affordable housing. The Liberals are saying that they can do nothing. We don't agree. The Liberal government has the tools to resolve this crisis. Why is the Prime Minister not taking action to help people? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I think that the Honourable Leader of the NDP did not listen when we said that, yes, we have solutions and we can do things, and we are doing those things to fight against the housing crisis. We are investing billions of dollars with municipalities to accelerate, uh, accelerate access to housing. We are putting in place rapid initiatives. We are creating different programs and expanding others because we know how much we need to be there for Canadians. We will continue to be there for people, and that is what this government is doing. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. 
the actions of this prime minister are not fitting for the crisis. Uh, the problem is, is that this Liberal government wants to help the ultra-rich instead of the average Canadian. Let me give a clear example. There is a federal land in Montreal. Instead of building affordable housing there, this Liberal government wants to give these lands to his friend Mr. Bronfman, a billionaire promoter. Why is this government favoring the ultra-rich instead of helping real people? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I expect personal attacks from the Conservatives. It's a bit disappointing to see that the NDP is now doing it. The reality is, is that we are here to work with the municipalities to ensure investments in housing. We're here to work to create more programs to ensure affordable housing. We're partners with Montreal, Quebec, and with investors who want to create a housing for all. The Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Echemins, Lévis. Bellechasse et Chemin Lévy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the opposition described the situation perfectly. Inflation is hitting Canadians hard. The Liberal government cannot deny it any longer. One of the mandates of the Bank of Canada is to keep inflation at 2 percent. Inflation is now almost 5 percent at present, Mr. Speaker, and everyone is suffering. If the Prime Minister does not maintain the 2 percent target, Canadian consumers will be the ones paying for his mismanagement. The question is quite simple. Yes or no, 2 percent. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives know full well that the current mandate of the Bank of Canada is in place, and it's at 2 percent. There will be an announcement very shortly on the renewal of this mandate. In the meantime, I can reassure all Canadians that we will be there to help them, to help them to have access to property, to help them to have $10 a day daycare, to help them to invest in young people, seniors, uh, we will be there to help Canadians as we have been doing since the beginning, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Echemins de Vie. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is reassuring no one. Everything consumers are buying now costs more, and Canadians' purchasing power is diminishing. You only, only need to talk to food banks, families, and seniors to understand that things are really bad. Can the Prime Minister guarantee that the Bank of Canada will keep inflation at 2 percent? That's a clear question, yes or no? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The member must know that the Bank of Canada is independent and must remain independent. Uh, from politics. But yes, we will continue to work with all respect for jurisdiction of the Bank of Canada to ensure that Canadians are well served. And that is why we are investing in housing, in child care spots, in assistance for seniors, young people, and workers. We promise to be there for Canadians despite the Conservatives who wanted us to invest less in Canadians during the pandemic. We are still there to help them as they need it. The Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Echemins de Vie. Galloping inflation is pushing prices up, Mr. Speaker. Canadians are suffering. Many can barely pay for groceries. Others are giving up their dream of buying a home because real estate prices have risen by 33 percent. The government's attitude is a frontal attack. Can the Liberal government show some compassion and notice that Canadian consumers have had enough? The question is simple. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I think it's a bit surprising from a member who campaigned on a single promise on housing for the Conservative Party, that is to give massive tax credits to real estate owners. That's not going to help families buy a home. It's the Liberal Party instead that has and had a concrete plan to invest with municipalities to create housing, to ensure affordability and the access to housing for first-time home buyers. We're here to help Canadians. At every step of the way, the Conservatives want us to do less. We won't do less. We'll do more. The Honourable Member for Foothills. What did the Prime Minister's office when Bud the Spud from the bright red mud rolled into Ottawa looking for help? They sent them to City Hall. Whoa. 
but it was Conservatives who brought the spuds back to Parliament Hill so they couldn't be ignored. Yeah. But potato growers in Prince Edward Island are frustrated that they are hearing nothing from their Liberal MPs. Well, 300 million pounds of potatoes sit idle, hundreds of jobs have been lost, and dozens of family farms are at risk. So will the Prime Minister do the right thing? Will the Prime Minister end his self-imposed export ban on PEI potatoes before Christmas? Yes or no? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, that I'm not hearing right. I don't think I am hearing the Conservatives propose uh, that we allow the Americans to impose a ban on PEI potatoes, because that's what they are proposing right now. We move forward uh, to make sure that we contain, we keep control over the situation. I had a meeting with Premier King uh, the same week as I had a meeting uh, with President Biden to highlight the issues we have right now. We will continue to be there to support, uh, get to, to support PEIers. Uh, and indeed the potato industry across this country. We will continue to be there to support Prince Edward Island potatoes in every way we can, as we have continued to support Canadians throughout these difficult years. Honourable Member for Foothills. So what the Prime Minister has just admitted that they self-inflicted a wound before the United States did anything, and has admitted that this decision was based on politics, not science. In fact, the Agriculture Minister has said the same thing, and the Liberal Member of Parliament from Cardigan said, absolutely there's no doubt. Politics is involved in this dispute with the United States. So will the Prime Minister end his half-baked ban? Will he expend some political capital, some political will, and end this dispute before Christmas? Honourable Prime Minister. I recommend the Conservatives actually engage substantively on this issue because we should all be a Team Canada approach and recognize that with the U.S. threatening to impose a ban on table potatoes from Prince Edward Island, we needed to act. We are continuing to work with the United States to put pressure on the United States so that we can move forward in a way that is safe for everyone and supports Islanders. The Conservatives are busy throwing mud and don't actually understand the issue. He talks about rich red mud. He should respect that rich red mud and get the facts straight. The Honourable Member for Foothills. Well, I wish the Prime Minister would show that kind of fight when it's the United States when some of our commodities are at risk. When it comes to our trade relationship with the United States, he's failed on energy, he's failed on softwood lumber, he's failed on dairy, yes. potatoes, and now the United States is threatening to instigate the mandatory country of origin labeling, which will devastate our livestock industry. The WTO has already said that cool violates international law. Will Canada, Canada's pork and beef industry be protected, or will the Prime Minister continue to outsource our trade agenda to the United States? we saw over the past number of years was the Conservatives trying and recommending that we cave on uh, standing up to the United States, and we did exactly the opposite. We stood up for steel. We stood up for aluminum workers. We stood up for people across the country. I'm going to have to stop the Prime Minister. I'm having a hard time hearing his answer, and I'm sure everybody wants to hear what he has to say. So I just want to ask everyone to just calm down, and if, if the Prime Minister can start from the beginning and uh, just answer the whole thing. Mr. Speaker, time and time again, we have seen the Conservatives recommend that we cave on standing up to the Americans. That was their approach. When we brought in retaliatory tariffs to stand up uh, for our steel workers and our aluminum workers, the Conservative leader called that dumb. Mr. Speaker, every step of the way, whether it was renegotiating NAFTA, uh, whether it's standing up for steel and aluminum workers, whether it's standing up for our auto workers, whether it's standing up for agricultural workers, this government has been there. The Conservatives have been playing politics and losing the plot. The Honourable Member for Avignon, La Métis, Matan, Matepedia. Mr. Speaker, Greater Montreal is suffering from a wave of shootings and tragedies. The Prime Minister should be doing everything possible to fight against illegal guns, but that's not what he's doing with Bill C-5. With C-5, he's eliminating mandatory minimums for importing guns and for the use of these guns during the commission of an offence. The Prime Minister is even eliminating these mandatory these uh, mandatory minimums for repeat offenders guilty of possessing illegal firearms. How does C-5 help to reduce gun violence in Montreal? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, we recognize the extent to which this is a huge challenge in Montreal and across the country. That's why we're taking this issue seriously with investments of $125 million to create a cross-border group to put an end to illegal gun trafficking, $250 million to support community programs uh, against gangs, uh, $327 million for police to have the tools they need to better detect and prevent crime, and at least $1 billion to help the provinces and territories like Quebec to ban handguns. Uh, we will be there. We will continue to be there to fight against violence, uh, with uh, gun violence. Um, the Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord. Mr. Speaker, to fight violence in Greater Montreal, the Mayor of Montreal and the Quebec government are asking the federal government to take action against illegal firearms. However, the first real action the Prime Minister has taken since the election in the area of illegal guns is to table C5 to abolish mandatory minimums. I quote the Minister of Public Safety for Quebec, who said it's important for the federal government to send the message that it's taking this seriously. Mr. Speaker, does the Prime Minister think that tabling C5 in the middle of a wave of shootings is sending the message that it's actually taking this seriously? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, we are taking concrete action to help to fight against this gun violence. There are many measures that can be taken. Yes, C5 is one of them, but $125 million to create a cross-border uh, group to put an end to illegal trafficking, money for community programs to fight gangs, give more money to the police to have the resources to better prevent gun crime. Yes, we will invest a billion dollars to ensure that Quebec and other provinces can ban handguns. For Calgary Nose Hill. Mr. Speaker, the Bank of Canada is supposed to be focused solely on reducing the rising cost of living. But some people are saying that they should be focusing on all sorts of other things outside of that, particularly policy that is the sole responsibility of elected representatives. Right now, people are struggling with maxed out credit cards. They're trying to figure out how to buy Christmas presents. The Prime Minister hasn't ans answered the basic question, so I'm just going to ask him something very simple. Does he agree that the Bank of Canada should only be focused on reducing inflation and keeping it at 2 percent? Right Honourable Prime Minister. The member opposite well knows that the current mandate for the Bank of Canada is uh, to keep the 2 percent target for inflation. Uh, we will be renewing the mandate uh, in the coming days or weeks, uh, and the, we will uh, uh, demonstrate that we are squarely focused on the preoccupations that Canadians have once we make that announcement. That's right. Member for Calgary Nose Hill. Well, why can't he just make that announcement right now? His lack of policy on this has created a lot of instability, and what that translates to the average Canadians is that they can't buy Christmas presents. They are struggling with maxed out credit cards. And what we've got here is a Prime Minister who doesn't understand that it is his responsibility to set this policy. The Bank of Canada should be solely focused on keeping life affordable for Canadians. Well, he announced today, the Prime Minister, that he intends to renew this exact mandate. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as uh, members of this House well know, uh, monetary policy and the work that the bank does uh, is independent of the work the politicians do. There are very clear rules around uh, how we create those mandates, how we renew those mandates. Those rules on this side of the House will be followed. I can reassure Canadians that the current mandate does have the target of 2%, uh, and we will be renewing uh, the mandate uh, in the coming days. That's right. And remember for Calgary knows Hill. Except the Canadian economy has seen inflation blow way past that target, and the average Canadian knows that. The average Canadian right now can't buy Christmas presents. I know that the Prime Minister not, might not understand what it's like to be struggling with a maxed out credit card, but most Canadians do. And that means understanding that he should be telling the Bank of Canada to focus on keeping life affordable, not making economic or fiscal policy that's his job and the job of this place. So will he today, very basic, very simple, say that he will keep that target at 2% through the mandate? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. 
We will be making an announcement in the coming days and weeks. Uh, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, that Conservatives have been misrepresenting this inflation crisis for the past many weeks. Uh, it is a result of the disruption around COVID-19. It is a result of disrupted supply chains. And we are continuing to be there to support Canadians, whether it's with $10 a day childcare, whether it's historic investments in countering the housing crisis, whether it's supports for seniors, supports for young Canadians. We have made a promise that we would have Canadians' backs, despite the Conservatives complaining that we've done that too much, we will continue to have people's backs. Here, here. Honourable Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. Misrepresenting the inflation crisis? Tell that to somebody in Kelowna today that's paying $1.67 a litre for gas. Tell that to the single mom who's trying to fill up her tank with gas, who's trying to buy her spouse a, a hockey jersey that's costing $100 more this year, or is paying $600 a month in interest on the credit card. The Prime Minister has misrepresented to Canadian his ability to manage a basic economic crisis, and what he could do today to reassure Canadians is tell them that he understands this, he's going to quell this crazy talk about the Bank of Canada, Canada wading into policy that he has responsibility for and keeping inflation at 2%. Yeah. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, over the past weeks, what have we seen from the Conservatives? Telling Canadians that the problems they're facing with increased affordability, uh, increased prices on everything, difficulty buying gas, difficulty buying computer. They shrugged and said, oh, it's just inflation. Well, it's not just inflation, Mr. Speaker. South. Mr. Speaker, a recent survey of young Canadians between 18 and 24 across major cities in Canada has found that the vast majority of them don't believe they'll ever be able to own their own home. I'm going to ask the Honourable Member for Burnaby South just to pause for a second. I'm having a hard time hearing him. Everybody wants to hear the question. Okay, the Honourable Member for Burnaby South from the top, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A recent survey of young Canadians between 18 and 24 year, year old across major urban centres in Canada have found, has found that the vast majority of them believe that they'll never be able to own their own place. Rent is going up, it's expensive to find a place to call home, and this Prime Minister is not responding to this crisis with the urgency it requires. So what does this Prime Minister have to say to young people? who've given up on ever being able to own their own home, who are worried if they can ever find a place that's in their budget. What does he have to say to them? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, every Canadian deserves a safe and affordable place to call home. That's why in 2017 we brought in the National Housing Strategy that has supported the creation of nearly 100,000 new units, repaired over 300,000 more uh, across all housing programs, and helped families get the housing they need. We've had a particular focus on first time home buyers, on young home buyers, with things like the first time home buyers incentive, like the Rapid Housing Initiative, like the Canada housing benefit, like waiving the fees uh, for, uh, for uh, purchasing uh, a new home, These uh, reducing those fees. These are things we've taken specifically to help young people buy a home. We're going to continue to do those. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister can continue all he wants. He's been in power for six years, and in those six years, housing prices have gone up. It's more unaffordable. It's harder to find a place to call your own after six years of this government being in power. And so the government says, what can they do? Well, they can do a lot. There are some concrete steps they can take. They can end blind bidding. They can tackle house flipping. And they can put a tax on foreign buyers. They can do that, and they can do it immediately. So why won't the Prime Minister use a fiscal update to put in place these measures to stop the housing prices from continuing to skyrocket? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. I have to admit, I was always, I'm always open to hearing suggestions from the members opposite on how uh, we can work together in this Parliament to deliver things. I was sort of pleased, though, to hear that the three initiatives he said were all three initiatives we proposed in our platform just a few months ago. We will continue. 
continue uh, to work with them and with all parliamentarians to deliver concrete solutions uh, for, uh, for home buyers. We will deliver uh, aid to Canadians to help them through uh, this housing crisis because we need Canadians. Uh, we need Canadians to be able to afford their new homes, uh, to be able to get into safe, secure housing. That's exactly what we're going to do, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Newmarket, Aurora. Mr. Speaker, this government has had the backs of small businesses throughout the pandemic by helping them stay open and keep employees on the payroll. People and businesses in my riding of Newmarket Aurora are concerned about the health and the economic impacts that the Omicron virus might bring. Can the Prime Minister please tell this House what this government is doing to support Canadian business through the COVID pandemic? Right, right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Newmarket Aurora for his question and for his tireless advocacy for the people in this riding. We introduced legislation to provide targeted support to those who are financially affected by the pandemic, including caregivers and those with COVID-19, and ensure no one is left behind at this critical moment. The measures in this bill are essential in finishing the fight against COVID-19, making sure the hardest-hit sectors are part of the recovery, and creating jobs. I urge all members of this House to support its speedy passage. Yes. The Honourable Member for Carleton. The Minister's response was just incredible. He said <laughs> even after house prices increased by a third, he didn't think about monetary policy. Even after gas prices hit a buck sixty in some places, he didn't think about monetary policy. Even as CPI hit a two-decade high, he didn't think much about monetary policy because he only thinks about himself. Won't he admit that what it took for him to start thinking about inflation is when we put his name in the word. <laughs> the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, from the very beginning, we have been focused on having Canadians back. Whether it was back in 2015 when we got elected on a promise to support the middle class and people working hard to join it after 10 years of conservative mismanagement, we have actually delivered for Canadians, whether it's on a housing strategy, uh, whether it's on support for seniors, whether it's on support for families. Through this COVID pandemic, we've been there for them. Even though the member of Carleton kept saying we were doing too much for Canadians, we continued to step up and have their backs. That's exactly what we're going to continue to do because Canadians deserve our support. They don't deserve conservative games. That's right. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, on October 28, 2020, the Finance Minister promised Canadians they would have deflation for the Prime Minister's benefit. That means prices go down. <laughs> Today, the Bank of Canada confirmed that we have inflation. Again, for those who don't think about monetary policy, that means prices go up. So everything they said would go down is going up, and everything they said is going up is now going down. Now that the Prime Minister has himself spinning in circles and saying his own name here on the floor of the House of Commons, will he finally admit that what we have in this country is just an honourable Prime Minister? Mr. Speaker, we've seen over the past many weeks Conservatives simply try to play uh, attacks and fling mud and lay blame and distract when the reality is Canadians deserve support. Canadians deserve a government like ours that continues to invest to support them with historic investments in infrastructure and housing, with supports for families and seniors. The Conservatives continue to complain that we were investing too much through the beginning of this pandemic to support Canadians. And what we've seen is our economic recovery is actually better than most of our peers because we were there for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, the Prime Minister got confused when he was asked, what is this famous middle class he's always talking about? It turned out, he said, it's those people who live off their income instead of their assets. Except that inflation hits folks who live off income the hardest because their paycheck is worth less while helping those people, like him, who live off of ancestral assets. Their assets appreciate and inflate in value. So maybe the reason he doesn't think about inflation is because he benefits from it. For example, can the Prime Minister tell us how much his mansion in the Laurentians has inflated in price since he took off? The Honourable, right Honourable Prime Minister. 
again, Mr. Speaker, we see the Conservatives choosing to focus on me when they should be focused, like we are, on Canadians. We will continue to be there to invest in countering this housing crisis with real investments from municipalities, as opposed to the member from Carleton's suggestion that we give tax breaks to wealthy landlords to help them sell their buildings. That's not what's going to help Canadians afford their first homes or, uh, you know, or retire in safety. That is the kinds of thing the Conservatives propose when we propose concrete investments in helping Canadians through. We promise to have their backs, and despite what the Conservatives say, we will continue to have their backs. Is there another one? Okay. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, speaking of wealthy landlords, I have here the financial stability report from the Bank of Canada, which shows that since this Prime Minister uh, started pumping $400 billion into the financial system, wealthy landlords have seen a 100% increase in the mortgage lending they've been able to acquire. Wow. Cheap debt for the wealthy investor class, high inflation for the working class. You see, more dollars chasing fewer goods means higher prices. Does the, does the Prime Minister realize that every time he takes a trip to the central bank, Canadians have to go over to the food bank? Yeah. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, a question like that from the Conservatives might have a shred of credibility had it not been for the fact that their entire plan on fighting the housing crisis in the last election was about giving a half a billion dollar tax break to wealthy landlords to help them sell their buildings. Uh, that is the kind of approach that Conservatives take uh, while they're trying to attack uh, the Liberal government. Uh, we will stay focused on Canadians while they stay focused on us. We will be there to have Canadians backs as we are every single day with investments in housing, in childcare and in families. Mr. Speaker, for weeks, everyone in Quebec has been asking the federal government to shoulder its responsibilities with respect to gun control. For weeks, we've been waiting for the first real step. But the first move was not to tighten the borders against illegal gun trafficking. It was not to take the lead in a collective effort by police. The first act was not to invest in border crossings. No. The first act was to introduce Bill C-5, which eliminates minimum sentences for illegal weapons. Does the Prime Minister think that the streets of Montreal will be safer after C-5 is passed? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, We've tabled C5 because we know that it's going to work to help reduce violence. It will help police to arrest criminals, and it will also fight against systemic discrimination, which the Liberal Party has recognized, but the bloc is so-so on recognizing. We've invested significant sums to fight arms trafficking. We'll continue to support our police forces in their ability to deliver, and we've invested a billion dollars to help a Quebec ban handguns entirely. The Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is completely out of touch. Today, the priority is to fight violence in Montreal. His priority should be to fight illegal gun trafficking at the borders. His priority must be to prevent weapons from reaching the streets. His priority must be to crack down on criminal groups. When he has taken responsibility for his areas of expertise, when he's done all that, then we can have a conversation about minimum sentences. When will he get his act together and put public safety first? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Our priority was to event $127 million to create a cross-border group in order to end trafficking in weapons, $250 million to support anti-gang programs in communities, $327 million to help police access the resources they need to detect and prevent crime, and a billion dollars to help Quebec and other provinces who want it to completely prohibit handguns. Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, there was a historic admission in the House of Commons today. The Prime Minister put aside his talking points about having people's backs, and the Prime Minister admitted the rising cost of gas, of food, and essentials is just inflation, Mr. Speaker. So with that admission, 
out of the way. Now knowing that inflation is gripping this country, rising cost of living is worrying families, seniors on fixed incomes, will he take the next step and today tell Canadians that he will mandate the Bank of Canada to get inflation back down to 2%? Here, here. The right honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, it is the Conservatives who have been saying that over the past many weeks. That is not the reality that Conservatives are, that Canadians are facing. Canadians need concrete support now, which is why we're investing billions of dollars so municipalities can create more supply. We're, we're investing uh, to support families, to support seniors, even though the Conservatives said we were doing far too much. And on the Bank of Canada, the member opposite should well know that the mandate of the Bank of Canada is to keep. Uh, uh, inflation at 2%. That's right. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, Canadians have seen just in the last few years houses go up 33%. Rents in Victoria, BC, in one year alone are up 20%. Families with children are using food banks more than ever before, Mr. Speaker. Families are worried. And they have a Prime Minister who said he doesn't think about monetary policy. A Prime Minister who doesn't seem to know about the rising cost of living. A Prime Minister who said famously, budgets balance themselves. Will the Prime Minister stand up in this House and say he'll fight for Canadians and get inflation back down? Here, here, here. The right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, one can always tell when they're getting desperate, when they tried yes. out every That's old right. attack line they've ever tried against me and against the Liberals, instead of focusing on what actually needs to happen. Canadians need a government like ours that continues to focus on them, not on petty political games. That's why we're stepping up with a real national housing strategy uh, to counter the housing crisis, why we're delivering $10 a day childcare, which the member opposite opposes right across the country, why we continue to be there for Canadians while they propose tax breaks for the wealthiest. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, this is a serious issue. This isn't about the Prime Minister, the Leader of the Opposition. He suggests we're getting desperate, Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker. Canadian families are getting desperate. Right. There are single parents worried about Christmas gifts right. this year. There are seniors on fixed income who can't afford to fill up their car. There are people worried about transient employment and driving Uber to save for a car over 15 years. Mr. Speaker, he has a time to not say, I have their backs. He has a time to say he will ask the Bank of Canada to get inflation back down to 2%. Here, here. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to inform the Leader of the Opposition that the Bank of Canada actually has a mandate to keep inflation right. at 2% exactly right now right. as we speak. Uh, what right. we are focused on is in making sure that Canadians get the support they need. That's why we've invested in them, invested historic amounts to help them through this pandemic, to help small businesses, to help seniors, to help workers. All the while, Conservatives kept saying we were spending too much too fast. Well, our investments have had the Canadian economy rebound faster than most of our peer countries because of what we did. Despite the complaints of the Conservatives, we will continue to have Canadians. Mr. Speaker, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and fighting climate change are a priority for our government. Clean technology plays a significant role in the sustainable growth of our economy. Can the Prime Minister provide an update to this House on our government's investments in the clean technology sector? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the member for Chateauguay-Lacolle for her question and her hard work. Our government has always been there to support investments in innovative projects when it comes to clean growth. For instance, zero emissions vehicles. We're making them more affordable for Canadians. We're also supporting the development and production of aluminum without a carbon footprint, and we're investing in Atlantic provinces. We will continue to invest in clean technology to ensure that we have sustainable growth for our economy. The Honourable Member for Mégantic-Lérable. 
How on earth did the Prime Minister allow his government to repeat the mistakes of the past? Canadian citizens have gone through hell and are still going through hell in quarantine hotels. No cleaning services, babies without milk, mothers without diapers for their babies, revolting meals. Does that remind the Prime Minister of anything? How can he accept such poor treatment of Canadians? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we will always be there to try and help Canadians who are caught in difficult situations. We're going to ensure that there's an understanding of rules at the border. However, our main priority is to keep Canadians safe. And we have to implement measures, even if they're difficult or complex, to ensure that the vast majority of Canadians who are staying in Canada can be protected from COVID-19. That's what we've been doing from the beginning. We encourage everyone to follow public health safety measures and for the Conservatives to get vaccinated. The Honourable Member for Mekant Éclairable. I remember the beginning of the pandemic, Mr. Speaker. The Liberals were slow to close the borders, slow to provide vaccines. The national N95 mask stockpile was expired. All of this greatly contributed to the first wave of closures and strict public health measures that everybody went through. And we remember the cases of sexual violence in the quarantine hotels. What did the Prime Minister learn from this? Absolutely nothing. The same mistakes are being repeated again, except this time the ministers are announcing their failures in advance. Why is the Prime Minister abandoning Canadians yet again? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, what Canadians remember is that during this pandemic, this government was there to support them. We were there when it came to vaccination. We were there to help businesses, to help families, to help replace paychecks for workers. We were there to support Canadians at every step of the way, and we will continue to do so. We have concerns about the Omicron variant, and that's why we're taking the necessary measures. And we will be there for Canadians who travel, but especially for Canadians who stay within our borders. The Honourable Member from Mégant Éclairable. The Prime Minister needs to quickly assemble his ministers to send a clear message to Canadians. The Minister of Health is announcing measures that the Minister of Public Safety says he can't implement, while the Minister of Transport is already announcing changes to come. It smacks of confusion and improvisation, and most importantly, Canadians are the ones paying the price. Arrive can, airport testing, mandatory quarantine. Absolutely nothing works. When will the Prime Minister call his ministers to order and work to help Canadians and not to harm them? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I'm a little worried when the member on the other side says that nothing works because the reality is that we are protecting Canadians from coast to coast with the best systems to protect Canadians from COVID that the world has ever seen. We are taking the necessary measures to, and we're listening to experts. Of course, that means adjustments, particularly with the Omicron variant. Of course, it means adjustments have to be made because COVID numbers are going up. But we will be there to make sure that everything is done to protect Canadians from coast to coast. The Honourable Member for Sudbury. Speaker, seniors built the Canada we know and love today. Their retirement should be secure and they should have the financial support that they need. GIS recipients are the most financially vulnerable seniors. Can the Prime Minister please update this House about what we are doing to help seniors make ends meet? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I'd like to thank the member for Sudbury for this important question and all her hard work. One of the very first things we did when we came into office in 2015 was to increase the GIS for seniors by 10% for the most vulnerable, those who have more challenges making ends meet in their retirement years. Ever since, we've continued to be there to help seniors who need it most, especially through the challenging times of this pandemic. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to be there for seniors and seniors know that this Liberal government can always be counted on. Absolutely. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've laid out how the housing crisis is impacting people and how inflation is driving up the cost of housing and how this government can take concrete steps to tackle it. We've laid out that this government can tackle speculation by putting in specific measures to stop blind bidding, to stop uh, property flipping and to discourage foreign buyers. 
They also need to respond to the urgency of this crisis by building homes that people can afford. We've called for massive and bold investments to build half a million new homes. Will the Prime Minister respond to the housing crisis with the urgency that it demands? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we agree. That is why we are working together on delivering massive investments uh, to counter this housing challenge as the Canadians are facing across the country. Whether it is by cracking down on speculatory practices or predatory practices to take advantage of, of home buyers, whether it's by going after, uh, by uh, limiting the impact of uh, foreign buyers in our housing market, whether it's by investing four billion dollars for municipalities to accelerate the construction of a affordable homes. These are the kinds of things we are doing, and we look forward to working with all partners in the House to get it done. Bravo. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. From coast to coast to coast, Canadians outside urban areas lack even the most basic public ground transportation. While the inquiry on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls called for such basic services, while our climate goals clearly require low-carbon bus and rail service, coach bus lines from Wilson's Bus on the West Coast to Maritime Bus await financial security and funding support, and a recent B.C. court decision called on the government in the interest of reconciliation to fund Vancouver Island Rail. Will the Prime Minister commit to a national network of low-carbon, convenient and reliable rail and bus service? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the beginning of this government's first mandate in 2015, we put forward historic amounts of money to invest in public transit across the country to support provinces and municipalities moving forward on investments in transit that's going to keep people safe uh, and reduce carbon emissions. That is what we have consistently done, including now with a permanent ongoing public transit fund that is going to support uh, municipalities large and small across the country with investing for the future. We know there is much more to do and we look forward to continuing to work with all members in this House, including the Honourable Member, to get that done. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. It's the time we have. It being